this something you learned when you were born an entrepreneur? You got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. But one of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam. Welcome to the Executive Lounge, your business thought leadership program that brings you the best minds and the insights of uh, the lives of men and women who have scaled the daunting heights of either starting their own business or managing institutions and organizations across the world and right here at home. My guest today is a fast-moving consumer goods uh, specialist. Uh, she has had extensive experience across the continent, east, west, north and south, and some stints in Europe. Currently, she is the CEO of Genem Salon and Spa right here in Accra and a co-founder of AfriBiz Group, uh, a business that specializes in providing insights into strategy for fast-moving consumer goods, IT solutions, and leadership training. My guest today is Janet Sunkwa Mills. You're welcome to the Executive Lounge. Oh, thank Lounge. you, Shira. Thank you. So, uh, let me just get this one out of yeah, the way. I yeah. didn't set out to ever interview man and wife, hmm. but your husband Cecil Sunkwa Mills has been in this chair before, and it's nice to have you as well. Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, but... It's quite interesting. Um, I've been quite fascinated by your transition from strict corporate work to run uh, a beauty salon and a spa. What informed that transition? Sure, it's a long story, <laughs> but I've had 22 years in the corporate environment working with Nestle. And indeed, like you said, across the whole of Africa, from the south to the west to the east to the north, and after 22 years, most of it, I must say, was outside Ghana. Mm. Okay. Then coming back home, um, I wanted to come back home and establish myself. So I actually came back home to the corporate world because I wanted to just limit my traveling a little bit and settle back home, you know, network, build relationships here and there. Mm -hmm. And then the job that brought me back home, I was out there again mm -hmm. didn't make sense to me so I <laughs> you, had you to returned stop. home only to have a job that sent you back out there exactly because <laughs> usually in the corporate world right when you've risen to a certain position and you are in charge of multiple countries you really have no choice but to be on the go all the time mm. so my reason for coming back was kind of defeated mm -hmm. by the new role i found myself in mm -hmm. and so i decided hey you know it's time to give it a break and then do something that I was passionate about from day one, and this is the beauty industry. Oh, so this is something you've always wanted to do? Yes, yes, yes. The interesting thing is I was born among five, no, four boys. So I have no sisters. Mm. And I'm married to a gentleman who you just mentioned. I have two sons. Mm -hmm. So I don't have no sisters, no daughters. Mm. So you can imagine growing up in that kind of environment. Of course, I, I was not into football. Uh, nor the boyish games. So what would I play with my dolls? And my mom used to teach me how to sew and stuff like that. In school, I would gravitate towards young ladies and make their hair, make their makeup, you know, for a little income. Mm. So I've always been passionate about making things pretty. Mm -hmm. So whether they're humans, they're rooms, gardens, whatever. I love making things beautiful. Wow. And that's it. Okay, well, that's something to explore. So you went after something that you enjoyed doing yes. and turned it into a business. Exactly. All right, but let's go back to your days in FMCG world. Okay. Um, I mean, you worked, uh, your experiences in Algeria and Morocco, I mean, um, North Africa. How different is that from, from, from Ghana, from West Africa? You know, I'll tell you one thing. I, I've, I've traveled so many places, indeed, even to Russia. And the way I survive this is because I'm adventurous by spirit and I see human beings as human beings mm. and nothing else. You know what I mean? Yeah. So irrespective of your color, your creed, your ethnicity, your culture, um, I see beyond that. So I relate to the human being 
in front of me. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, I try to understand who you are. Mm -hmm. So I'm really crazy about understanding human beings, and that's why I'm a marketing strategist, because we provide solutions um, to serve certain human needs, mm -hmm. okay? Or those in pet care will do that for animals, etc. But it's understanding who you are. That's what ticks me. Mm. So in um, Algeria, when I, in fact, I was fascinated to go there. First of all, because it was a new environment to me. The experience in the airport is different. The experience when you enter the session, your luggage is different. Um, the way you dress is different. But the uh, human beings, mm. the need state is the same. So if it's about food, I, I worked 20 years in Nestle. And I worked with a brand called Maggie. It's a big brand here, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a big global brand. It's one of the iconic brands in, in Nestle. Mm -hmm. And what we focus on is providing nutritious solutions for families. Mm -hmm. So you tell me, how does the Algerian mother differ from a Ghanaian mother who wants to provide nutritious solutions for their families? Their ingredients may differ. The choices in terms of meal solutions may differ. But ultimately, the nurturing, basic, fundamental human need of nurturing is the same. It cuts across everywhere. So the experience is nice in the sense that it gives me diversity mm -hmm. and knowledge and experience. Today I'm talking to you about Algeria. Yes. Movement, you know. So I enjoyed it. It was fascinating. So it's quite interesting. You mentioned that human beings are the same everywhere. So the needs are pretty much the same. Um, little things might differ. Yeah. But the, from the point of view of someone who may not, uh, or really I didn't uh, work in your space, but your strategy would be different. Um, what informs varying your strategy? Same product, different markets, but you vary the strategy uh, for going to market. What, 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 what informs Okay, so that? let's take um, a culinary solution, for example, mm -hmm. Maggie Brand. It could be any other culinary product there. So you go there, you try to understand what are the ingredients they're using, what is their repertoire in terms of choices of ingredients. Mm -hmm. So you probably notice that the taste profile is different. Um, if Let me talk about West Africa, for example. I take across from East Africa to the, I mean, as further back as Tanzania, all the way to Senegal. Mm -hmm. Across Congo, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, we all have leafy green vegetable dishes. We all have beans and lentils dishes. Uh, to a certain extent, we all have pulses dishes, mm -hmm. but the taste profiles differ. So whereas Ethiopia is using more spices, they have this they call berberi, which is it's a mix of, I don't know, 10 to 15 spices. In Ghana, you're probably mixing garlic, ginger, onion, papushito, ojengba, or whatever it is. In Kenya, it's pretty bland in Nairobi, but when you go to Mombasa, it's a different taste profile. When I go as far back as Senegal, the profile is different. Let me not go into the controversial mm -hmm. jollof rice, the fight between <laughs> Nigeria and Ghana. Well, you know, we're the best. That, uh, that they know. They uh, 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 mm -hmm. you know I, I worked in both countries. <laughs> so here, is, the type of rice is different. The spices are different. The cooking steps are different. Mm. The way they slice leaves in Morocco is different from the way we slice leaves in Ghana, etc., etc., etc. So there are nuances in there that you can adapt to fit the culture. Your key thing is to identify what are the commonalities. If you want to develop a regional strategy, you're mm -hmm. looking, what are the commonalities? Mm -hmm. Because uh, as a business strategist, you're looking for the big picture. You're looking for a big market, the size of the price, which is big enough mm -hmm. for you to make business decisions. But when it comes to the execution, then you vary the execution. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the spice element to be different between Ghana and Kenya, for example, between Ghana and Morocco, for example, between Ghana and indeed Senegal, for example. Wow. You know what I mean? So the, it's so interesting. It's amazing. Mm. If, if I bring it to the, the world of Jane M, mm -hmm. hey, different types of hair. Okay. Different types of skin tone. 
different, different, different. I mean, if you look in front of a woman's dressing mirror, the things that you see there. Plenty. I'm telling you. But basically, she just wants to make herself pretty, right? But she uses different, different things. So my job in JNM is to identify what is a commonality and what will give you a personalized solution versus another person. Mm. For me, the reason I want to give you a personalized solution, then you feel unique, mm -hmm. you feel different, you feel cared for. That's the essence of the thing. Wow, that's interesting. I mean, you simplified it so well. Um, so even though the strategy might be very broad, yeah. it fixes a specific need, yes. albeit personalized and yes. varied depending on culture and the little nuances that yes. make us different. Yes. But at the core of it is the same thing. It could be the same thing. I want to provide nutritious solutions. That's the big picture. Now the execution will differ mm. okay. depending on where Let, I am. Let's turn our attention to you as a person. Mm. You know, you went through school and you did French, uh, sorry, you did English and Russia. Yes. Um, <laughs> why that choice of linguistics? I, I told you I was interested in human beings. Understanding human beings and communicating in a way that makes impact, in a way that resonates, in a way that will make you move is what takes me. Mm. So languages for me, languages and linguistics was very easy for me to gravitate towards. And well, whatever I inherited from my family allows me to pick languages pretty easily. Mm. So I went into the university. R uh, Russian was not a choice for me, actually. I wanted to do English, French and linguistics. Mm. And then a friend of mine then, um, he's in uh, Canada right now. He's one of the, he's not a lecturer, in fact, he's a big guy there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then he said, why don't you study Russian? I said, Russian, why? I mean, come on. I mean, I, the alphabets are written differently. R turned upside down, it's pronounced separately. Mm -hmm. He said, how am I going to do that? And how am I going to speak this language? And what am I going to use it for? But then the, the spirit in me that loves adventure, I'm like, they said, okay, then you get to spend one year in Moscow. I say, hey, let's go. Okay. So then, okay, so one year abroad, I'll tell you a very funny story. You promise not to laugh. I will not. Can I laugh now? So I don't have to <laughs> laugh later. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a group of students from the University of Ghana, dressed in our African print, you know, marketing Ghana and all, shoulders off, landing in Moscow. It's like a cloud, a black cloud of smoke, because this, this is why it's here. Entry into Moscow somewhere in October, November. Ouch. Had no idea what the weather was like, mm. blah, blah, blah. We just landed there. Boy, oh boy. We couldn't even move because it was that cold. Wow. And everyone was just looking at, who are this boy? I mean, then the, 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 they were in a period of perestroika. That's right. Okay, so they, they had no experience with Africans per se. But here we were, a group of black, uh, you know, cloud coming in mm -hmm. and it was so funny because we couldn't even move out of the airport into the bus because it was that cold wow. but it was an amazing experience amazing mm. I loved it amazing. so how did you finally get on the bus so their bus driver had to drive and position the entrance of the bus to the entrance, like door to door. So we just hopped so in there. Hopped into yeah, the yeah, yeah. We just hopped in there. Wow. But it was fun. We enjoyed it. Yeah, it's a nice story. <laughs> See, I didn't laugh, It's a reality. Right? <laughs> it was but, not a story. But, but so you didn't have travel advisory before you left? You know, you read things here and there. But in the university, you're all kind of, oh, Charlie, we dear, we can. What is called, you know, waiting, waiting, man, no see before. Until uh, then. Yeah, the until it hits you, until you. it goes to the minus 20s and minus 30, and you're like, what? What one key lesson would you say you picked on your one year in uh, Russia? What I loved is never judge a human being until you have interacted with them. These Russians, I mean, before we went there, we had her stories, they are not nice people, they stern, they mean. Uh, but 
for at least from my perspective, that was not what I experienced. And it's the same thing. I mean, this lesson that I learned from Moscow has helped me through my expatriate life in Nestle, in a sense that do not judge people. Make your own decisions based on your interactions mm. with them. Because in Nigeria as well, yeah, Janet, can you stay in Nigeria? This Nigerians out there, tough out there, this. But I had an amazing time in Nigeria. They either like you or they don't like you. But if you pre-church them and they know that you have pre-church them. And you lost it. I'm sorry. Hmm. It wouldn't cut for you. But hey. So no judging. No judging. Um, you have a, a keen passion for mentoring and leadership development. Um, I wonder where that came from. Hmm. I don't think I was born in nature, but um, growing up, I found myself in a situation. I told you earlier on, I have no sisters, uh, four brothers. And very early on in my life, I became their mom. Mm. Okay. Because my mom was working, uh, she was, uh, or she is, uh, Miss Lucy Banini. So she was at the broadcasting house very early in the morning and stuff like that. So growing up, I had to take care of my brothers, make sure they have eaten, make sure this, make sure that. So through that, naturally, I became a nurturer, okay? Watching things grow and making sure they grow well. I'm passionate about that up to today. Mm. So I, actually what it came home to me and very easily was I, I went to London Business School and um, we were asked to describe ourselves. Of course, I'll describe myself professionally. And then the, the facilitator said, why don't you try to um, describe yourself alternatively. So I gathered a group of friends, people who worked with me, I said, what would you describe me as? If somebody said one word, what would it be? And they said, mm, you like taking care of people, blah, blah, blah. And the word natural came in and I realized that was it. So either my brothers, they all call me sister, even my mom calls me sister to today. Either my children, that comes naturally anyway, my flowers, my pets, whatever, even a genem, Whatever I'm doing, I have to nurture it. Mm. If your hair is like this and you want to grow, I, I, I will be the person who is interested in understanding your hair. What can make that hair grow and how can I nurture that hair? And this is why the, nurturing, um, the mentoring thing comes to me very, very easily. When I, I meet people um, and I feel within me mm. that they have the ability to grow, if they're well cared for, if they're well guided into the thinking processes and the choices they make in life, they can actually realize their, their full potential, you'll find me there. Mm. So I belong to the Executive Women Network. That's this, right. This is a group of uh, executive uh, women. There are over 100 of us and it started by, let's say, let's get executive women together and network and support each other. But today is something else. We go into secondary schools, mentoring the young up and coming girls. Um, I got a mentee attached to me and I mentored her through the process of last year. Today, without going to further details, I'm part of a group of women uh, that we've been consulted with to mentor young ladies and young girls in Ghana. And I'm really passionate about this because I think everybody given the opportunity can grow and can make the right choices. Mm. We're going to explore how you've used your ability to nurture, um, to grow the, the Maggie brand across uh, several countries, including uh, winning an award, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Sir. All right, we're going to take that break now. And when we come back, I'll be bringing you more insights from uh, Janet Sunkwa Mills, our guest on the Executive Lounge. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Addo and my guest is Janet Sunkwa Mills. She's the CEO of Janem Salon and Spa here in Accra and also the co-founder of AbFreeBiz Group and uh, marketing professional. She speaks French, uh, Russian, um, just a, an adventurous spirit um, and loves to tend her flowers and nurture uh, things. I wouldn't tell the world that you do love cactus, but uh, that's a conversation. <laughs> that's, 
that's a conversation for another day. Um, but, you know, you've done different things. Started off doing linguistics, did your master's, did marketing. Um, how did all of that come together? Um, because quite a lot of the time, a person's success story is often linked to things that are in it in them. Mm. How did formal education and the choices you made mm -hmm. um, sharpen those innate abilities that you had? Okay. You know, the interesting thing is, when I meet a group of young ladies today, they tell me, um, Madam, you know, I don't even know what I want to do. I'm going to school. I don't know. Hey, you're not alone. I didn't know what I wanted to do at a certain point in my life. Mm -hmm. In fact, all the way to my first degree, at the end of the first degree, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. Wow. Because um, then I said, languages, are you going to lecture? I, I was a TA and I was, okay, I can lecture. Then I said, okay, why don't I proceed with my education? So then I went on to do the MBA. The funny thing is when I went to do the MBA, <laughs> they were like, Russian and English. You're coming to do MBA. I mean, do you know what MBA entails? Quanti, mathematics, mm -hmm. you're a pure abstinence. I mean, do you think you can handle this? Lucky for me, well, lucky for me. Uh, because my first degree, I got a first class. When you have a first class, you are open to choices. Except, of course, medical. Mm -hmm. You're open to choices. So then they granted me the admission in there. And then whilst I was in there and uh, mastered with the marketing option, I said, ah, oh, this really is not a bad thing, mm -hmm. this marketing thing. It ties in very well with my passion of knowing and understanding who the human being is. So if this is what I'm interested in, and marketing is about understanding your consumer, building that into insights, and then filtering that into a need state. Careful the words I'm using, mm -hmm. I'm not saying need. Mm -hmm. A need state. I'm not saying you need uh, to wash your clothes. I'm saying your need states because it, it fundamentally it's a functional and an emotional need. Now for a marketer to be able to connect, you have to connect on an emotional level. Now strong brands connect emotionally. Mm -hmm. So then we, we understand what the need state is and then we translate it into a physical, tangible product solution or an intangible service solution. Mm. But ultimately, as a professional marketer, when I'm communicating with you, I'm trying to hit your heart first and not necessarily your mind first. So if I'm able to connect your heart then the, the rest to your mind, easy. it's easier. It's easier. But the journey of connecting that is not easy. Mm. So you find people would have done sales in school, I say, yeah, marketing. Or to idea or cancer, or see me here marketing. Missing the marketing, what you ask, yes, I just will call marketing now. Okay, okay, this is another level of what marketing is. But marketing is a science that you need to understand and connect with your consumer on an emotional and a physical level and translate this into solutions, mm -hmm. be they tangible or intangible. intangible. Um, solutions. So this, this is my, my story. Wanting or being passionate and of un, uh, by understanding who the human being is mm -hmm. has helped me on the journey of marketing and amazingly has transitioned into Jenna. Okay. So prior to this and in your, you know, illustrious 20 years of crisscrossing the continent uh, working with Nestle, how would you say, in terms of cultures, I mean, when we, people differ culturally. Um, you did some work in the Francophone space. Granted, you speak French, but at your core, you're Ghanaian. Yes. Um, how did that shape you? Um, did you suffer any culture shocks along the way? And, and how did you bounce back from all of that? I, um, I will call them challenges that we have to surmount. Everywhere you meet different people. I mean, just the next door neighbors, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivorians are 
they are next door neighbors, exactly. but they are very different in the sense that they were colonized by the French, mm -hmm. whilst we were colonized by the, the English. English. Somehow, the, the colonization process went deep inside. So the way they behave is very different from the way we behave. Now, there's one thing that I had said earlier on. I filter out that part of it. So when I'm facing you as an Ivorian, I face you as a human being first. Then the influences that makes you an Ivorian, then I understand that. And then together I make my impression of who you mm, are. Mm, mm. So I've been to places where they will ask me, are you Ghanaian? I said, yes. In Nigeria, are you Nigerian? I say, I'm Ghanaian. Ah, but how come? So I have a, a, a Nigerian name. They call me Adaize. Mm. Because when I'm there, I will merge into the environment. And if you're not careful, you will think that I'm from that environment. And this is me. So but you are able to adapt. And that's because easily, you have no prejudices. Easily, easily. Very easy for me to adapt to new situations. It's challenging, but... I guess because I love to explore new things. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine an explorer that is not adaptable. How do you make it? You, you can't make it. Mm. it. It goes hand in hand. So this is me. I, 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 I can survive everywhere. So in, in, the, in the various cultures that you experienced, mm. I mean, Greg, you're looking to explore and you're ready to adapt. Um, but there's always the question of, okay, a high-flying female. Mm. Um, how did you deal with that? I mean, in, in, there's some cultures that just were not cool with the idea of reporting to a female. That is so true. And uh, when I went to Nigeria, that, that was it. Um, first of all, you're female. Secondly, you're not Nigerian. Uh, waiting, you, you, they come look for here, safe. This place, we day here. Ghanaian woman, waiting they come search for. But you know, the point is, because I tried to relate to you based on who you are. For example, there were, in Nigeria, all the ethnic groups uh, have their own, you know, vibe. Mm -hmm. But in the East, the, from Abba, and these are proud men. And they are the traders in Nigeria. The, the business rocks in the eastern part of the country. So the question is, a lady, how do you meet your, your, your customer? Mm -hmm. Who is this proud guy? But you know, <laughs> when you try to understand him, everybody loves to be related on a level that they believe that you have their interests at heart. Mm -hmm. Not your interests, but their interests at heart. So the marketer in me tries to find out, what is your issue? Because you have to see me as a solution provider, not as Janet, not as a woman. I have to break that boundary. It's the same thing if I went to the north of Nigeria. Uh, when you go into the open market, they are all men. They are not women. Wow. Yeah. When you go to Meduguri, Kaduna, whatever, they are all men. So first of all, I have to dress up and look like one of them. Secondly, you can't shake hands because this is their culture. But you, you have to understand all that prior to going for a market visit or prior to going for an in-home visit. You know, when the people understand, you respect my culture, you try to understand me, and you try to bring me solutions, the reception is very different versus when you go in there with an imposition, with a chip on your shoulder, with, you know, uh, mm. it doesn't fly. doesn't fly. So in the corporate world, as a, as a woman, first of all, I don't believe, and this is personal to me, that just because you're a woman, you should be given certain privileges. You gotta prove that you can deliver, and to a certain extent, deliver better than the one next to you, irrespective of whether they're uh, uh, male or female. Okay. It's your skills, your ability that counts, and your ability to deliver results that counts, mm. you know. So focus on that, mm -hmm. not on uh, I'm a woman and this and this. Focus on that, and when you focus on that, with confidence and commitment, and your ability to market yourself, now that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Traveling around, what I've picked is, sorry viewers, but this is my experience. Most Ghanaians are with their, oh, with their fama nyame. Me yeme jumano. 
I mean, my work will speak for myself. Yes, it does, but you have to market yourself. Mm. You have to put yourself out there. When there is a meeting, you have, if you have an opinion, express it, you know, kind of thing. You have to market yourself. You have to build yourself as a brand and you have to work hard. Nothing comes easy. Sometimes the, the millennials, and I have nothing against millennials because my kids are millennials. Mm -hmm. You want very quick solutions. Um, you employed me in three years, I have to be this. No, no, it doesn't come that way. You have to work hard. You have to build on your experiences. You have to build on your skills. And when you say, I can deliver A, you should be able to deliver A better than anyone else. So that's that's where that, that value that you're craving for would, would be validated. Yes, 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 yes. You have to deliver value to your consumer, to your, to your shareholders, to, to everyone who has trusted you enough mm -hmm. to give you a job. Wow. You have to. Let's take a trip into the Sunkwa Mills household. I mean, you're a, a mother um, yes. of two sons. Yes. Um, and as my wife sometimes says, you, the husbands are your sons, so you have three sons I that have you look three. after. Um, but you're high flying executive, traveling, highly adaptable. Um, but how were you able to bring the two together where you're paying attention to the needs of the home and still being successful um, in the corporate world? It is not easy. Don't let anybody fool you <laughs> and tell you that it's easy, first of all. And don't let anybody tell you that you can do it alone. You cannot do it alone. Mm -hmm. You have to juggle. And you, from my perspective, Inshira, you cannot sacrifice um, your role as a mother, as a natural. Sometimes the tendency is when you pursue your career, you tend to neglect some of your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And look, I may get a few people attacking me here and there, but I believe that men and women are different for a reason. And that um, a woman is given the role of being pregnant and having children for a reason. A woman is given a role of breastfeeding that baby for a reason, because we are born naturists. This is who we are. So to neglect the job of a natural and expect, because I'm going to work, you, my husband, are also going to work. Why don't you do this? The man should help. My husband helps. I, I, I will tell you if you know my husband. He's my number one cheerleader. Huh? So in the home, whatever I need help with, he does it without even thinking twice. I know there are some men who don't, but I'm fortunate to have one. But I don't neglect my responsibilities. That uh, my children should be looked after very well, that my husband should be looked after very well in terms of satisfying their physical hunger and emotional need, I'm there. Is one of my value systems. My family is one of my value systems. That my, my house is not a house, but a home which is full of love and my family is happy to come to when um, everything else fails, that thing. That should be the rock they run uh, No, that home should be there when everything else fails and you know that there's one place that I can go and there's no judgment, I'll be accepted and is warm and has this feeling, you know, my, I have to have it. And that is no compromise. Right. That is also a value to me, as well as my job. So I find a way of, you know, prioritizing the must do mm -hmm. or must have, the nice to do, and the one not to do. The must do, I don't compromise. The nice to do, well, it's nice if you can do it. If you can't do it, I put it aside. You know what I mean. So this is how I've been able to do it. Setting my priorities mm -hmm. very uh, well. Identifying what means value to me. Mm -hmm. My family, my home, uh, my job, of course, because it puts food on the table. My team at work, they're part of my family. And I, I, I juggle that. 
luckily for someone like me, we are in the modern day era. Mm -hmm. So technology and the Skyping, the WhatsApp, hey, everything, name it, I'm there. I mean, the kids are not here with us. We are empty nesters. But almost every weekend we're chatting with them. So we know what's going on in their lives. They know what's going on in our lives. Mom, how was work today? Did any client annoy you today? <laughs> Did your staff annoy you today? Hey, how are you? Do you have a girlfriend yet? Uh, what is she stressing you? Uh, Mom, I have this chick. What do you think? Hey, I'm part of their lives. They're part of my life. So you have to be able to balance it. Mm. You can't neglect some. Because Nagbe. Mm -hmm. If you speak uh, Nagbe, when you're retiring, <laughs> you need someone there. Mm. It could be your husband or your friend or somebody or somebody, but you neglect all of them. And when it gets to Nagbe, after you become your CEO, what do you do? You're all on your own. Uh huh. And don't kid yourself, the newspapers will keep you company, or the TV or the series or whatever will keep you company. You need the relationship, that human relationship. That's what keeps us growing. Wow. So I will encourage um, ladies who are building their careers, either in the formal corporate environment or as an entrepreneur, as I am today, you got to set your priorities, differentiate your must-dos from your nice-to-dos and the not-to-dos, and then allot your time accordingly, but you need help. There's another thing that just occurred to me. The tendency is, um, as corporate women, uh, someone has to help you at home. Eh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it could be a family member or um, a house help or a domestic help. The tendency is we treat them sometimes as servants. Mm. But you know, after some time in my corporate life, I realized that these ladies are more of partners to us. They are partners in nurturing our homes. If I'm not there and I expect her to dish this food out for this child mm. and she doesn't do it the way I do it because she feels that I'm not interested in her needs, what do you think she'll do? And How would she serve my job. kid? Yes, yeah, so we have to somehow, I know it's tough, eh? I'm just speaking like this, but I've gone through several of them. It's not easy, but we have to look at them as partners in nurturing our families. Mm. And then from that perspective, maybe you get um, a better deal out mm -hmm. of it. Wow. Mm. Very insightful uh, thoughts and, uh, you know, uh, perspectives on this. And uh, it's evident that you don't subscribe to this notion that, you know, you either put home on hold, pursue career, and then pick it up and start. Or if you're going to do home, then focus on home and drop career. For you, it's about prioritizing and balancing and it balancing, as you go along. And balancing. Wonderful. We're going to take our final break. Uh, when we come back, we will be uh, heading into some very interesting uh, territory. We will learn a little more uh, from Janet Sinqua Mills. This is the Executive Lounge. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge, and uh, I'm in Shirado. My guest is uh, Janice Nkwamil. She's the CEO of uh, Gen M Salon and Spa here in Accra, and uh, co-founder of AfriBiz Group. Um, marketing strategies, uh, specialty in the FMCG space, traveled the world, done fantastic stuff. But let's get to know you. you, okay. you, you, you. What values drive you? I know you mentioned that one of the values is your family. I'm sure there are a few more. Mm, there's so many. And I let me tell you a story. Um, the story being that a lot of people will ask, if I asked you a question now, were you born with a silver spoon? I don't know. I wasn't there. Well, I was okay. there, but I don't remember. But what's your understanding when somebody says silver spoon? Yeah, privilege, right? Privileges. Mm. Is it? Mostly it's financial, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. But, you know, I have understood it differently. And mm. this, uh, someone got me thinking when they asked me this question, that the silver spoon doesn't have to be financial privilege or privileges. It just has to do with nuggets of wisdom or mentoring as you grow up. So, for example, my grandmother was a silver spoon to me mm. because she taught me hard work. 
She taught me commitment. She taught me consistency, and she taught me resilience. Wow. And she was one of my servers, but my mother was one of them. Mm -hmm. My mother taught me determination and focus. Mm -hmm. My mom was one of my silver spoons. My husband is one of them. He taught me the power of we. Mm. Okay, so I have several of them. So I don't have one value. I have several of them. Depending on who I encountered in my life and what values they imparted into me. And all of them have culminated into who I am today. So my grandma taught me resilience and hard work. And these are values to me. Mm -hmm. My mom taught me focus and determination. These are values to me. My husband taught me the power of we and support. These are values to me. Um, I grew up in a single parent home. So I'm, all, I'm driven by not having that. And therefore building a family as a unit is key to me. Mm. So family unit, the warmth that goes with it, the love and everything that goes with it, is value to me. Mm -hmm. And these have, you know, shaped who I am throughout life. Mm. And everything I do is about that. Mm. So uh, how do you, I mean, course, you're a nurturer. Of course, yeah. God. Right at the center of it all, huh? <laughs> I mean, where I have been and where I am now, there must be something else driving it apart from me. There must be something else. And that something else, or that someone else, is God. Mm. Nothing would happen without him wow. or her. That's great. So let's take your ability and love for nurturing and mentoring. Um, of course, because you're a product of several different mentoring and nurturing yeah. um, uh, encounters in your own life. You're an entrepreneur now. You carry the weight of the dreams and aspirations of JNM on your shoulders, <laughs> and you have staff. Um, one of the challenges of entrepreneurship is getting everyone to buy into the vision. Um, how are you able to get your people to run your team to run at the speed that you want them to. <laughs> That's a good one. You, you, you can imagine my shock after traveling everywhere, all sorts of experiences. And this Nestle, you know Nestle, when we talk Nestle, mm -hmm. uh, the structures and, you know, it's on another level. And then I start this. And, you know, straight from the university, I actually got a job at Nestle before I wrote my final paper. Mm. So you can imagine Nestle is running through my veins head to toe. That's right. So I'm, uh, personally, I'm a structured person. So I get into this environment, driven by my passion and wanting to do so many things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, did you just throw yourself into this? <laughs> <laughs> Completely unstructured. Mm. And things are fluid like that. You know what I mean? And um, the teams are not Nestle teams. These are people, they just have talent, okay? Not necessarily literate in the strict sense of the word, writing and reading, but they just have talent. So you're selling their talent or you're selling a solution to, uh, for example, I talked to you about knee states and when a client walks through me, I'm not looking at uh, washing their hair and styling their hair. I'm looking at making them feel good about themselves because I believe that when you feel good, your confidence level is something else. Mm -hmm. You know when you're like dressed up, yeah. uh, your work is different. You feel know? a million bucks. Oh, I'm telling you, the way you walk <laughs> and strut, even if it's on borrowed items, say like you're rocking it. Yes. So for me, when you walk into JNM, I'm more interested in how you're feeling after your experience in JNM, not necessarily the final fiscal output. Of course, the final fiscal output contributes to that. So it's been challenging um, getting them to buy into your vision because you're from two different worlds. But you can, you got to keep doing it every day. The other thing is how do you build a culture of your vision? Mm. You know what I mean? You want things like this. How do you make sure they do it that way? It's an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm there every day. This is my work. Mm -hmm. I go there every day. 
Um, by education, I'm not a hairstylist or a spa therapist or a, a skincare therapist, but I, I'm now pursuing an education. So I'm a certified hair colorist mm. and cutter. Okay. And because of my training, Listen, I'm reading everything about hair and skin and uh, what's the science behind it and how can I nurture it to bring out the best in it. Because what, what I do as well, I try, I try to enhance what God has given you. Mm. This is my dream in uh, JNM. What has God given you and what can we do with it? Your hair, your skin. Um, yeah, basically... Um, this is it, you know. So it's challenging building a culture, but I'm there every day with them. They see me work as well. So you see me in the salon, washing hair, cutting mm -hmm. hair, coloring hair. So they know that Madame is part of So if Madame can do it, why can't I? If Madame can sweep, if a staff is busy, because uh, you know, you're busy, so uh, with cut hair, I'll just take the broom and and sweep it, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that because remember my grandmom taught me hard work and diligence, you mm -hmm. see what I mean? So I'm with them, I work with them, I try to do the best I can for them and this is how we rock. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, I mean, let nobody kid you. I keep saying, let nobody kid you. I'm an entrepreneur, I am a CEO, you know, hey. Ah, yeah, well, no it's work. hard work, <laughs> yeah, man. You gotta get into it and work hard. It's yeah. not easy, it's, it's not about sitting home. No, you got to be there. You got to be there. Because if things aren't going right, you don't have it an is opportunity your if you're at, it's you at the end of the day. You, you're building it from a scratch. So you have to build it and shape it into what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So how can you build if you're not there? How are you building it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Th this is my perception. It's not, uh, okay, she, she has the finances or the investment, so she's, no way. You're building a brand. So Janem is a brand that we are now building. We are the beginning stages and it's building up rather nicely. I'm enjoying the journey. Yeah, yeah. That's good, mm. that's good. Well, that seems like all time would allow us oh, uh, that's so nice. far. And it's been uh, a very, very worthwhile conversation. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank Anna. you, Shra. You, know. you inspire me, by the way. Oh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so here are my five takeouts from today's conversation. That number one, you're the sum total of all the experiences that you go through in life from the silver spoon concept that uh, Janet shared with us. At the people you meet, the people you talk to, the people you work with, the people, some even who don't treat you well, have a lesson in there for you. And those things, if you put together, shapes who you become. Number two is that you should have an adventurous spirit. Um, take new opportunities to go to new places, to meet new people with an open mind, and you'll walk away with some lessons as well. The third thing is that it doesn't matter how you start, you just have to have determination. You can start off doing linguistics and, um, and then go and do an MBA and then in the end, open a spa, and run it and become a hair colorist. <laughs> uh, life is how you make it and, and it's based on the decisions that you take and where you want to see yourself. And the fourth thing I'm walking away with this, uh, from this conversation is that you must be hands-on at whatever you do. As you grow, if you're hands-on at the lower level and you grow to a higher level, you must still be hands-on because you show by example what good practice is. It's not written, it's not something you say, but it's in what you do. And for me, the final thing is that you should always remember who made you. Never forget the God factor in everything that you do. You may have a great ability, but there's something that powers that ability. And with that, I thank you all for tuning in and thanks to the team and the guys at Villa Monticello and also, again, to you, Janet. Oh, my so pleasure. It's been my fantastic. Pleasure. My pleasure. So, until the next edition of the Executive Lounge, I say goodbye to you. Go forward, make rain. Shalom. Is this something you learned? Were you born an entrepreneur? You've got to start small. I have not allowed 
been a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. One of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. It was the right. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam.